Welcome back to the Essential Films Podcast, a podcast devoted to the discussion of the greatest movies ever made or the essential films. I'm Adolfo <laughs> Costa, your host, and I am joined by my co-host, Mr. Mark Espinoza, and the trick, Mark, is not minding that it hurts. On today's episode, we will be taking uh, no prisoners as we discuss Lawrence of Arabia. How are you doing today, Mark? I'm pretty good, my friend. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. You caught me there. I was drinking a, taking a swig of my... Uh, alcoholic beverage how you been uh, how you been doing since we last talked uh not too bad um to uh get ready for my big return to the movies uh, i'm fully vaccinated as of a week ago as of this recording so i'm kind of anxious to get back in the swing of things now yeah me too I've, I've been waiting to get back to the theaters myself i haven't done it yet i'm assuming you're gonna go back to uh your beloved alamo absolutely i'm just trying to pick the perfect opportunity to do that um so far I mean, there's a couple of things I could go to, especially some of the newer releases, but I'm wondering for that, like, perfect re-release of that perfect classic film. This is the one where I mark my return. It hasn't happened yet, but I feel like pretty soon I'll get it. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, even though theaters are opening up and the country's getting vaccinated, I think the the window from uh, movie theater to on demand or uh, on demand at home is still pretty short. Like I just saw the other day that uh, the new uh, saw movie with Chris rock uh, spiral is already on available to rent. Uh, and it, that just came out like a few weeks ago. So even though the, the cinemas are opening back up. Yeah. That was um, a few weeks ago too. And, and yeah, I planned it, on uh, going to see it as well. Yeah. It, it, that's interesting. And I, I'll probably go see that in the theaters as well. Cause I mean, if you're going to pay, cause I mean, if you're going to pay the same amount of money, you may as well see it in the theater. Right. Exactly. I mean, I, I thought about making a Quiet Place Part Two my return. I'm trying to make that happen. It might not be the Alamo return, but it'll probably be my first movie back, like in an actual, like in an AMC. Right, and thankfully the AMC uh, Stubbs uh, Rewards Program is still available, so you just have to reactivate it. Um, and that's what I'm going to be doing uh, whenever I finally go back. Um, I'm also thinking of uh, doing for my birthday, which is coming up at the end of this month, uh, renting out a private screening. Um, cause AMC does those. Um, uh, and so I was looking at the different movies. If you want to watch a new movie, like a new release, it's like $250 to rent it out. But if you're going to, but if you can pick like older films and it's only a hundred dollars. So I think that's what I'm going to do. Um, uh, cause then I could have like my family and everything there. Um, the only problem is there's not a lot of great options <laughs> for the older films. The best option I found was back to the future, which is a great movie. Obviously, I just don't know if it's super kid appropriate like i mean i guess it is but there's some maybe some conversations maybe that aren't super kid appropriate i mean there's a, there's a few options you can do like for example at alamo right now i'm just kind of going through what they have right now and there's a couple that i could i could have said yes to to mark my return they're sold out though for example they are showing um raiders of the lost ark so that would have been a great one but unfortunately i found out about it too late and now it's sold out and plus they're still doing the um the separated seating the six feet and all that so it's limited uh capacity so even though they're technically by the law now allowed to open at full capacity they're still going to exercise some caution and they're still doing the i think maybe 50 percent or whatever it is so i missed out on it unfortunately but i'm sure there'll be another one coming through the pipe that i'll be able to jump on yeah so i'm glad that they're still doing the limited capacity even though we will get back to full capacity at some point even though they're they're allowed to go full capacity i'm glad that they're still taking their time at the you know limited capacity that's that's a good idea i think so too and check out some of these other ones uh they got um they got blade runner 2049 they got babe for the little kitties over there uh, i like babe though that that's a good flick no babe's a good movie uh, let's see, we got Air Force One on July 4th, or freaking awesome, I'll say, you can edit me out there for that, but I just, that deserves the F word, how great that movie is. Uh, let's see, we got a uh, Serial Mom, which is a, a wacky one. Oh my you god, got, uh, Serial Mom. <laughs> Serial <laughs> Mom. <forgot> <laughs> you got The Fugitive, which is another great one. Uh, you got, oh, they're showing Ishtar, bro, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of on brand to our to our discussion today, actually, a little bit. Kind of, yeah. And then um, 
And then you got the current ones. You got like they gotta have Cruella, they have Quiet Place, and they have In the Heights for next week. So, or actually, it's this week now. So, um, so yeah, so things are rocking and rolling over there now. Yeah, well, maybe uh, soon when we do a Force perspective, we'll actually have new content to talk about. Exactly. Um, all right. Um, so enough with the new. Let's get on with the the classics here. Um. Uh, as I stated at the beginning of the show, uh, today's episode is going to be Lawrence of Arabia. Now, we're going to do things a little bit different uh, when it comes to breaking down this film. I'm going to get to that a little later, but as is tradition, I'm going to start with how did you first discover this movie? And, you know, how, is it, how has Lawrence of Arabia been a part of your film viewing life? <sighs> All right. Um, this, one, this one's pretty special to me. It's not necessarily one of my favorite films it is a great film i do enjoy it very much but this is still a very special film to me because this was one of the films that my grandfather absolutely adored and this was the film that uh my mother kind of passed down to me through the generations like my grandfather watched this film with my mother when she was a little girl on television. I think they were showing it on ABC, I think. They were doing the two-night deal. And that was when they first watched it. They watched it together over the two nights. And he just was such a big fan of this movie and kind of passed that love of Lawrence of Arabia down to my mother. And then, you know, once I started getting into the whole swing of things in my cinephile life, you know, watching Turner Classics, buying the books about the greatest films ever made, and, you know, there was a whole passage on Lawrence of Arabia. You know, I, she would always mention, oh, you know, that's the film that I watched with my father. You know, he kind of sh- loved that movie. He shared his love of that movie with me. We watched it together when it was on television. And then one day we kind of saw it on the listings for Turner Classic Movies. And we're like, you know what, let's let's make it a thing. Let's watch it together. It was my first time watching it. And I'll never forget that. It's one of those memories I can share with my mother. That was almost kind of like passed down, almost like a tradition. So if I'm ever fortunate enough to have my own kids, I one day want to have that experience with like my son or my daughter passing down a movie like Lawrence of Arabia to them. And, you know, I mean, other than just that kind of familial aspect to it for me, I just the film is just a grand spectacle. And we're going to get into a lot of that when we talk about the movie. But it's just. I, I'm able to appreciate so much of it now. Like the, the acting is, is amazing. Like Omar Sharif is excellent. I love Alec Guinness here. Peter O'Toole is also excellent. There's a lot of great acting here. A lot of great character actors as well. But then you also have just the big landscapes and the cinematography of the desert and, you know, of Arabia itself. And it's just, it's so, it, it, it looks like a big feel type of movie, like a big event type of movie. And over the years rewatching this on my own, it's just I'm able to appreciate just the, the camera work and the blocking and just everything about this more and more. The practical effects they use, you know, especially using like the, all the camels and the horses and the stuntmen, like all that is just everything. Everything's on point here. And this truly is just based on all of that. And just, you know, the story's great as well. Very engaging story. It is really one, one of the best films ever made. And I'm just kind of glad that. I was able to have that experience watching it for the first time the way I did. And I hope to one day be able to pass that on as well. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, my mind is not nearly as interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I basically came to the film just like I've told before on several other occasions that this is one of those movies that, you know, was on the list. You know, it was on the list of the greatest movies, so I had to watch it. And back in the day when I first got Netflix, it you know, it was on the list and I eventually watched it. Now, the first time I watched it, I appreciated it. I liked it a lot. You know, I liked it. It was very I thought it was very good. Um, and then upon subsequent viewings, my appreciation of it grew. You know, every time I saw it, I found something new. You know, I understood it a little better because, let's face it, some of the uh, political machinations involved with the two sides uh, can get a little confusing sometimes. But, um, you know, I understood what was going on just a little bit better after as it went on. But it wasn't until and I always thought it was great. I always thought it was a great movie. But it wasn't until I think about two years ago it was two or three years ago Um the Turner Classic Movies does this thing, the big screen classics, where every year, you know, once a month, they uh, they release uh, they they release nationwide uh, a classic film with an introduction by Ben Mankiewicz at the beginning, uh, 
you know, talking about the film and everything. So allow allowing audiences to go back to it. And they about two or three years ago, they did Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, and once I saw it on a big screen, that's when my appreciation for it truly took shape. Um, and now the, the, the movie was filmed in uh, Super Panavision 70 millimeter. I don't believe the screening was in 70 millimeter, but it's still just to watch it on a, like, you know, a 20 foot screen that's to see like the, the majesty of that film on a 20 foot screen. That's whenever I finally got like a, a, a really deep appreciation for it, even though I loved it before it like took it to a whole new transcendent level. Um, and just like you said, every, you know, with the, the acting and the directing and everything else, but like the, just the, the filmmaking involved with this, this is like what the word epic was meant to describe is Lawrence of Arabia. Absolutely. And, you know, I kind of gave myself with this most recent, a uh, screen, I tried to do the whole theatrical experience. I had the nice chair set up. I had my popcorn. I had my drink and I did the whole, the full 15 minute intermission. I was about it was to say, for the intermission. The intermission? Yeah. <laughs> what about the? No, I, the I actually took a fifteen minute break. I, I I got up, I stretched, I walked around, I went to the bathroom, like I was at the movies, like I would do. So I I did the full experience for this last one, and and it really kind of helped enhance it for me. Now, did you sit through the entrance music? I did. I sat <laughs> through all five minutes of that. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it, I did. I mean, I did. You know, I've mentioned before. Like, one of my gifts to myself was getting this huge TV and, and set up like a, my own kind of little private theater in my basement. And and that's that's the way I watched it, man. This is not a movie you watch on your computer. Um, even though right now I have it on my computer to kind of reference as we as we do the show. But uh, this is not a movie you watch on a computer or on your phone. This is a movie you watch on the biggest screen you possibly can. And uh, yeah, to truly appreciate it uh, at its most. So before we get into the breakdown of the film, I'm just going to go down some of the basic stats. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia was directed by the great David Lean, uh, produced by Sam Spiegel with a screenplay by Robert Bolt and Michael Wilson, based on T.E. Lawrence's book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. It stars, of course, Peter O'Toole, uh, Sir Alec Guinness, Anthony Quinn, Jack Hawkins, Jose Ferrer, Anthony Quill, Claude Rains, the great Claude Rains, uh, Arthur Kennedy, and Omar Sharif. And I believe his first American film role. Uh, it has music, uh, iconic music by Maurice Jarre, uh, iconic cinematography by Freddie A. Young. And of course, we rarely talk about this, but uh, game-changing editing by Ann V. Coates. And we'll talk about some of her editing a little bit later. Amazing so, list there. Yeah, I mean, this is a this is a bona fide uh, bona fide list. So before we get into the main uh, all of the main things we're going to talk about this film. I want to address two things. One, historical accuracy. Uh, I, in my research for the film, I know that this is not completely historically accurate. This right. is not. We're not concerned about that. Uh, I know that it, it, it's kind of generally accurate in kind of like the highlights of things, but it, when it gets down to the details, there's a lot of stuff that they either made up or kind of combined or shifted times. You know, the time frame around. That doesn't really bother us. It doesn't. It's not really something we care about because, for the uh, the 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 sake of filmmaking, it makes it better. Um, the other thing, uh, Alec Guinness in brownface. Yes, it happened. <laughs> it's unfortunate. Uh, it's not. You know, especially when you have other actors of color in the film playing. You know, accurate. Uh, accurate uh, people. To I had their, a feeling we were going to address this. I mean, you kind of have but, to. But you know, it it did. It, you know, whenever you have Omar Sharif standing there, and then next to him is uh, Alec Guinness in brown face, it, it's a little jarring. I but it's the it's I I'm not sure about you. It's just not a conversation. I think is I don't want to say not relevant because it's relevant. It's not a conversation that is going to really get us anywhere. I'm not really interested in that conversation today. Uh, I just want I just really want to talk about the movie itself. Of course, it's. It's it's shitty that they did that, and it was a different time. It was the '60s. That's what they did, you know. But yeah, I'm kind of surprised that happen. you know. I don't think Twitter has has discovered this yet. But let let's they haven't hope that they don't eventually don't. <laughs> All right, and funnily enough, I was reading that uh, before he did uh, David Lean did Lawrence of Arabia. He was considering doing a movie about Gandhi. With Alec Kidness playing God, I read that. So at least, <laughs> like, at least we should be. Maybe we should be happy <laughs> that he didn't go to that go that direction. 
Um, apparently, Ben Kingsley has some sort of Indian heritage, which is why it was okay that he did it. Because um, I never thought that he was... I always thought he was like a pure English white guy, but apparently not. Uh, but uh, yeah, Alec Guinness, we know it's unfortunate, but we're just going to move on from that conversation. All right? Okay. So, <clears throat> so at, at the top, I mentioned that we're going to change things up a little bit. And... This is kind of born from the fact that this movie is long. This movie is a four-hour long feature film. Uh, and it uses up every minute of that four hours for to great effect. But it's a long film. And if we were to go beat by beat through every single story point that happens in this film, I think the podcast would be just as long. I don't really think that you want to listen to us talk for four hours uh, about a film that you could be watching instead. So... Uh, instead of doing the usual beat by beat, and I think this is how we're going to handle things from now on with future movies, is we're just going to talk about the discussion of the film uh, in a discussion of the story generally. Can, we're going to hit the highlights, and then as we're kind of talking about it, if we veer off into other conversations about the production or the actors or the casting or a scene, then we'll talk about it. But we're not going to go, okay, in this scene he did this, and in this scene he did that, and in this scene he did that, like we have been doing. We're just going to kind of cover the basics. Yeah, and I think it's especially we were talking about this, you know, before air, like how are we going to cut go through the beats of this four hour movie? We're probably going to make it even twice as long just doing that. So I think the, the idea, the um, I guess the method you just came up with to kind of just go through the, the main story beats. Uh, let's hopefully uh, make make good use of time with that, you know. So let's talk about it um, now before we get into the general story. The we do we need we need to address what the historical uh, background of the film is. So this film depicts uh, is based on the Seven Pillars of Wisdom, which was written by Lawrence himself, and it depicts his time, basically with the Arab armies as they re- revolted against the Ottoman Empire or the Turks uh, during World War One. The Germans were uh, allies with the Turks, and the English were allies with the Arab uh, with the Arabs. This kind of documents uh, the English. I don't know what you call the the English, uh, not bureaucracy, but the English higher ups, whatever you want to call them, kind of placing Lawrence within the Arabs to lead a revolt and kind of uh, help him take Aqaba and uh, and uh, Damascus to basically for strategic purposes. Um, and that's kind of the general background of the film and what they're kind of basing this on. This is the time frame of his life that they're focusing on. Uh, before that, Lawrence himself was. Uh, an architect, most not an architect, <laughs> an archaeologist. <laughs> he was an archaeologist, um, <laughs> and he was basically drawing maps uh, and studying the region for for England. He was not a soldier in and of itself because I think he was too short. Um, but he was basically there, and they, you even see at the beginning of the movie he's drawing maps and stuff, uh, and kind of doing kind of boring work. Um, but he's mostly a scholar, mostly uh, intelligence, um, and kind of we take off from that. Uh, from that point in the film, but that that's the historical background of the film. Yeah. It, and amazingly enough, I learned nothing about the Arab revolt when I was in school, learning about world war one, that was completely glossed over at least <laughs> where I, where I was in school. I didn't learn about this until I was in college. And even then I watched Lawrence of Arabia before I even got to that part of the class in college. So, um, my mind was kind of blown by all of this. Like I was watching this and I'm like, when did this happen? World War One. I. I never <laughs> learned about this, dude. Uh, here, here's I can break down all of high school history for you in ba- in the, all the chunks that they spent on it. Ready? Uh, Revolutionary War. Then, con- no, well, first of all, Constitution, Revolutionary War, bunch of boring stuff. Civil War, <laughs> bunch of boring stuff. Uh, World War One, Arctic uh, Franz Ferdinand. Then we skip right to World War Two. Then a bunch of nothing. Then Vietnam, and that's it. <laughs> like, that's all they covered. <laughs> that's pretty much it, yeah. I mean, there were other stuff in between, obviously, but they never talked. Oh, we talked about the Great Depression, too. But uh, obviously, the but, like, the amount of material they spent on just the on just basically the revolutionary, civil, World War One and World War Two and Vietnam, that was, like, the chunk of history that we got, and everything else was, like, barely focused on. Exactly. And it's just like it's like eye opening when you watch something like Lawrence of Arabia and it's like, well, I didn't learn this in school. This is kind of interesting. I would have been cool with this. Yeah. (laughs) The film kind of starts out really cool. It's kind of very it kind of recalls Citizen Kane. Uh, It starts out with Lawrence's death. 
Um, it's, it starts out with him uh, basically dying in a motorcycle accident, which is how he really died. And then kind of we go into his funeral and we see people asking about, wondering about who this man was, kind of like Citizen Kane. And then we kind of fl- uh, flash back and see, you know, basically spend that the the chunk of time that I described earlier. We spend that part of the motion picture uh, in, in that time frame. Um, now, of course, Citizen Kane... Th- takes a different format where it interviews people throughout the film and jumps around in timeline. It doesn't do that. It's a pretty straightforward narrative, but I think the, the, I think it does kind of borrow from that beginning of Citizen Kane a lot where it starts out with the protagonist dying and then says, who was this guy? And then, Hey, let's go find out who was this guy. Exactly. You know, it, the, the illusion of Citizen Kane is pretty obvious, but what I do like about this too, is that, uh, you know, like we said, the story starts with Lawrence's death, but if you, as the story progresses from there and we get the flashback of his time, you know, in World War One, we kind of get foreshadowing as to how he dies. There's a few instances which are pretty cool where they kind of foreshadow his own destiny. And, I mean, we'll probably hit those as we talk about, you know, we hit some of the high points of the movie. But I think it's kind of cool that it starts this way. And then, like, as you go through it, you kind of see he's like, oh, they're kind of foreshadowing how he dies. It's it, it's I like when, when movies do stuff like that. So now... Let's talk about Peter O'Toole. Uh, Peter O'Toole was cast as T.E. Lawrence. And if you look at the pictures of the real uh, Lawrence, and then you look at uh, and you look at uh, Peter O'Toole, it's almost perfect casting. I mean, as bad as the Alec Guinness casting was, the Peter O'Toole casting was almost perfect. Because they look really similar. They look very much alike. Now, I think in real life, Peter O'Toole was a lot taller. But yes. just the facial structure and and their you know co- and, and their complexion and everything they like they look like they could be related. So really excellent casting. But interestingly enough, he was not the first choice. Albert Finney was apparently the first choice, uh, but uh, he was uh, he he was fired <laughs> for two days like it, it, like two days into the movie. And there I haven't found a reason why, but it's interesting that he was cast but then fired. Yeah, nobody seems to know why Albert Finney was fired, and I think that's interesting. I, I kind of tried to go through different websites to see maybe, you know, there was some sort of answer, but no, like, nobody knows why he got fired. He just got fired after two days. It's uh, I don't know. Maybe it was one of those, like, Back to the Future <laughs> instances where maybe the they Eric figured Stoltz. out early But enough. Eric Stoltz, at least, like, yeah, Eric Stoltz was, like, almost filmed the whole movie. Exactly. <laughs> you know? well, like, my, my point is maybe they figure out two days in, oh, yeah, we, we catch the wrong guy. Like Eric Stoltz, basically, he was there for like he filmed most of the movie, like you said, and then they figured it out. Now Albert Finney probably would have been fine, but the other people that were considered before they eventually went to O'Toole were um, Marlon Brando. Imagine how weird that performance would have been. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Perkins from Psycho and Montgomery Clift. I think those are all wrong choices for for that for the role. Mm-hmm. Marlon Brando is way too Brando, <laughs> you know. Perkins, uh, I don't have, honestly, I don't have much of a sense of his work outside of Psycho because I haven't seen much of his work outside of Psycho. He Maybe he could have been okay, but Montgomery Cliffs, I think, was too much of a, I don't know, too much of like a uh, matinee idol to pull this off. Like, And he was a fine actor, but I don't know. I just don't see him in the role. Um, and, but uh, Brando, that would have been weird. Yeah, Brando, I, I, I can't see that at all. That that would have been, that's a weird choice to, as, a, as a possible... Uh... Lawrence, I, I I don't see it. But yeah, so we 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 cut to uh, at the big after his death, we have uh, we have him basically drawing maps in like a little schlubby room, um, and he's he's basically called upon by uh, Claude by Claude Rains to uh, and and his kind of this general I forget the general's name doesn't really matter um, mm-hmm. to basically say that he needs to, because of his knowledge of the region he needs to be sent out to uh, to where the Arabs are to kind of start helping them revolt against the Turks is that's going to help them against their fight against the, the Ottoman empire. Um, and you know, ultimately, lead, uh, ultimately leads to victory against uh, Germany. So, and so blah, blah, blah. So he gets sent out on this trip. He has a guide. And while he's on, on uh, while he's out with his guide, they stop at a well. And I think one of the coolest shots of all time, actually two cool shots before one cool shot before this, which was the, 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 the match cut, but I'm going to get to that in a second. Yeah. Um, but the one of the coolest shots, I think, of the entire film is the shot where they're at the well. And then you just see very far off in this distance, uh, a, like a, a shadowy figure start coming slightly 
you know, very slowly towards the camera, and they keep cutting back to it, cutting back to it, cutting back to it, until finally it's Sheriff Ali who kills his guide for drinking from the well. Um, but that's such a great shot, um, and it's it's one of the most iconic visuals, I think. I think anybody who's ever seen it always remembers that specific shot and then the match cut, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, specifically from this film. So a couple things before I get to that, that mirage scene, which again, it's, it's just excellent camera work or whatever they did in the editing room to make that shot the way it is. It's just, uh, just an amazing feat. I want to get to that in one second, but I do want to point out one line that general Murray, since you forgot his name, um, <laughs> I, there's one line that kind of stuck out to me right before, you know, Lawrence is in the desert with, with the guide where he says, um, it's, 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 that's what he says. He goes, you're the kind of creature I can't stand, Lawrence. But I, sco- I suppose I could be wrong. All right, Dryden, you can have him for six weeks. Who knows? I make a man out of him. And that kind of <laughs> that line really struck me because it's like he was right, but maybe not in the sense that he he thought. Because, yeah, he in the, in a way yeah, he became, quote unquote, a man. But, yeah, there's Lawrence has, has a bumpy road here character wise and I, and I know we'll talk about that later but I kind of love how that line kind of just set the um set everything up like as far as Lawrence like for his you know hero's journey or lack thereof but um but yeah so the mirage scene is just so great like even in with this recent uh viewing that I had like I couldn't remember exactly like how the like what the effect was so when that scene came and I'm like sit, sitting there like is that like somebody walking and I remembered oh, duh that's uh that's Omar Sharif but it's like I'm even I'm trying to squint at the screen like is that a person and then you see like that mirage effect where like you know you're in the desert and then you're probably on the verge of death from not from dehydration you you think you see like all these spirits and these visuals and it's like I don't know how they did it but that effect was perfect and what a great way to introduce Omar Sharif that's probably one of the greatest entrances in cinema right there I mean yes totally it, that that ranks up there pretty high as far as one of the greatest entrances um and it's such a great such a great you know like you said earlier about the the practical effects I mean there was the, there wasn't really an effect here it was just nature you know the 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 heat waves of how hot it is in that desert creating that mirage and you just basically filming that in camera so like you have that effect where like the sky kind of blends in with the ground. You don't know where the ground is and the sky and where the sky ends and the ground ends. Uh, and it's just such a cool visual and, and that just, you just filmed it naturally as it happened. Such a, I mean, I just geek out over stuff like that. It's such a beautiful. And then obviously yeah. and, and it builds suspense, right? Cause you're, they're just sitting there watching because the guide takes his time before he runs and gets the gun to, to defend himself. Because he's, he knows he shouldn't be there because it belongs to um, it's Sheriff Ali's tribes well. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, you know, why we get the famous line, as long as the Arabs fight tribe against tribe, there'll always be a, a silly people, you know. Um, and because, you know, they're all divided against in all these different tribes and, you know, that belongs to his tribe and the guide's tribe should not be drinking from that well. Um, that's why he was shot. But the the whole the suspense that builds between like when they first see him and before the guide eventually reacts. Uh, Cause that, that they're just like staring at the horizon, staring at the horizon, cut back and forth, staring at the horizon, back to them, back to the horizon, back to them, back to the horizon, back to them. And then finally he gets to the gun and they get shot. You know, it's great suspense. Little people, a silly people, greedy, barbarous, and cruel as you are. <laughs> like that's a great freaking line. And I quoted it to you, I think when we tried to do the show before, but, uh, that line always stuck with me and then again they they repeat that line almost because of motif throughout the movie because they keep bringing it back in subtle ways which i'm sure we'll get to as we go to the high spots but that that's probably one of my favorite lines in the movie and of course what happens to lawrence at one point he becomes barbarous and cruel at one point exactly um and so we talked a little bit about the editing there so let's backtrack a little bit to the famous match cut that we get so we get the scene where you know, right before he he goes out to his trip, he's playing with a match and he blows the match out, and then suddenly cuts immediately to the desert where he's uh, like a, I don't know. I think it's sunrise where like the sky is orange and like it's the the sun is coming up over the dunes, and you know he's already on his on his trip in the desert. Um, but that was ed- an editing uh, choice by Ann V. Coates, uh, who I think only recently just passed away, like a year or two ago. Um, it's one of the most famous match cuts of all time. So, I mean, 
you, you might say, oh, in a four hour movie, like the editing is has to be really important. And not only is it obviously really important in the whole film, but she does little moments like this where she cuts to him blowing up the match, cutting right to that scene or the suspense that it builds in that scene where uh, Sheriff Ali is coming up on the horizon. It's great editing in this film. Um, it's not something that we normally call out, but it's just something that we need to talk about. Of course. And then with that match kind of going, you know, you, you dissolve into the desert from the from the from the match. And then, of course, you get the huge, uh, the amazing uh, Maurice Jair score, the theme song for Lawrence of Arabia just blaring. And that's one, again, that's one of the most classic, probably the, one of the greatest theme songs in cinema. We have the greatest entrance of a character theme song in cinema. It's, it's definitely at least, this Lawrence of Arabia theme is definitely a contender for that. I could hum this or I could listen to this all day and I wouldn't get tired of it. Oh yeah, it's so good. It's 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 one of the iconic one, the iconic soundtracks. Uh, and I'm trying to think like it's up there with, I don't know, it's up there with like Star Wars or with uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm picking John Williams scores because they're all so iconic. But you know the all the the major scores that you can think of, like it's right up there with with them because it's so iconic. Like you've pro- even if you've never seen the movie, you've probably heard it like at an award show or something. You know what right. I mean? It's just one of those 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 soundtracks that it just gets you. It's it and it feels like it, it feels like what the movie is, right? Because it has the 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 instruments that they're using and the tune that they're playing kind of seems like it's this exotic, you know, desert theme, right? But it's also grand and like huge, just like this movie is. So I, it's, it's a phenomenal score. Exactly. So we talked about uh, Omar Sharif a little bit. Um, he plays a uh, Sheriff Ali, and apparently he was based on a combination of the so Sheriff Ali character was not really a person. He was based on a combination of different Arab leaders, um, and I believe one of them was Prince Faisal's cousin. Prince Faisal existed, uh, but Sheriff Ali was kind of amalgamation of, of people. Um, but Sharif was, I believe, a uh, Egyptian actor. He was already a star in the Middle East. Uh, so he had not done any American films or British or American films because this is really a British American joint production, and uh, he was offered to uh, he successfully screen tested for the role. Um, apparently, originally it was going to be Alain Delon, but uh, he declined after a while. But that's a uh, wacky yeah, sure casting we... choice. If, yeah, if Alain Delon would have would have been that, that would have been kind of interesting. <laughs> Yeah, he he was, uh, but yeah, this this made a huge star out of Sharif, obviously, and uh, and he came back for you know uh, David Lean's follow up uh, to Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Doctor Zhivago, and he became a huge star after this. So yeah, this made him a huge international star. I agree, and I, I, I he was robbed from that Oscar. I think he should have won. Who won the was it was it Guinness that won for this? I don't remember. I don't remember. I, Maybe uh, we'll look it up as we go through it, but. Uh, I think it should have gone to Sharif either way. I liked Alec Guinness here, but Omar Sharif was like amazing. Yeah, he was he was brilliant, and, and he didn't need brown face. Exactly. <laughs> and man, what a what a handsome dude! You know, <laughs> like uh, it's, <laughs> he's just a good looking dude. You know, it, like not many people can pull off that mustache, but he could pull that mustache off. Let me tell you. <laughs> yep. So you know, in this scene where he where he kills the guy at the well. Not only do they get, you know, an introduction between we we meet Sharif uh, and uh, so does so does Lawrence, um, but you know we find out about the different tribes and he tells them that Lawrence is welcome to drink from the water and that's why he tells him that line about you know greedy, barbarous, and cruel. And this is where Lawrence is kind of we kind of see where Lawrence is kind of thinking about how he wants to unite all the Arabs. He doesn't he thinks that being divided amongst tribes is stupid because there's a common enemy to fight. And if you're divided, you're not going to win. Um, and that kind of really pre- that fuels his thinking and his motivations throughout the entire film. Right. So, you know, as we go through the film, he basically try he, he keeps that mindset throughout his journey until. I mean, I don't want to get too far ahead, but eventually that that mindset of his comes crashing down <laughs> when he realizes that that's never going to happen. But um, th- but this is a good setup, you know, for for Lawrence's you know character journey as well. Like he has this motivation, this mindset. Okay, you know, I need to unite the arrows because you know together, you know, they can defeat this enemy. And I want to make it my my mission to do that. And that that's a good place to start. Now, after he finally arrives at the kind of the camp of Prince Faisal. 
uh, he gets a meeting with Faisal and, you know, Ali does eventually show up there because because they're, you know, they're allies. Um, but he basically convinces uh, Prince Faisal that the real way to proceed is not to retreat, which was, which was what uh, Colonel Brighton uh, wants him, wants them to do. But he says to kind of basically push forward, cross the Nafud Desert. I think that's how you pronounce it, which is like this uncrossable like barren landscape of a devil hellish desert right um and then surprise attack uh the uh the turks at aqaba because they wouldn't expect an attack from that side which is from the desert side um right. so he it convinces them to do it and he uh he convinces them basically faisal to do this and he takes you know you know a, a big troop of men with him to do so and i know i think this is the scene also like like they're trying to convince uh Prince Faisal, you know, they should do Akub, try to, I mean, well, Lawrence, I mean, it starts off, like, remember, Brighton, when, when Lawrence first gets to Brighton, like, Brighton's basically telling him to just sit down and shut up, like, let me do all the talking, but then, you know, Faisal kind of sees, you know, when, when they're having their big meeting that, you know, maybe this guy has some good ideas, you know, let's listen to what he has to say, so he's trying to, trying to give him some, I guess, some, some of the spotlight, you know, Lawrence, you know, if we take Akaba, you know, he can come from the desert side, you know, that we have a chance of taking the city, you know, and, you know, uh, Sheriff Ali is like, well, nobody's come through, you know, through that site. It's impossible to cross that desert, you know. So he, at this point, you start seeing kind of Lawrence get a little bit, I guess, full of himself, maybe a little cocky because, you know, Faisal is seeing that there's something that this guy could possibly be right. And he wants to give him a shot. But that's when you start seeing maybe Lawrence kind of get into his own skin, maybe get a little cocky. But. Like, what's that last about maybe 15, 20 minutes, that whole sequence of them going through the desert? It's a really, really great scene. And it, you get a lot of character development in those 15, 20 minutes as well as they're crossing the desert. It's really a really starts gripping you a, a, as an audience member. Yeah, it, it's it's the way it's shot. And again, compliments to David Lee and compliments to Envy Coates and to the to cinematography where it's it. You're just watching it, and it just feels like hell. You you feel uncomfortable watching it. It feels like literal hell. It looks like literal hell that they're walking through. Uh, <clears throat> and when they, you know, because like the first react when he tells uh, Sheriff Ali about it, uh, he he's like, "You're mad. This is this is insane. You can't do that. The food cannot be crossed." But eventually, he wins him over. And what I think is interesting is that eventually, you know, when we first meet Faisal, like he seems kind of like benevolent, right? But then as the as the film goes on, you see he's a little more crafty. And you kind of see it a little bit here. He's willing to let kind of Lawrence take the heat for this, right? And like willing to let him try and, 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 you know, and try and get this accomplished because why not? Like he's not going to really lose that much uh, himself. Lawrence convinces, convinces Sheriff Ali. And then they take, you know, a bunch of men to cross the desert. And like you said, it's, it it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I don't know how long it is, but it takes a long time to cross that desert and you, you feel it in the movie. And I, what I especially love is that they get there, they realize that one of the men, and uh, I think, think his name is Gassim has been lost. And at this point, Lawrence is already full of himself. I crossed the desert. I did it so I can do it again. And he goes back to get Gassim. Um, and I, it's one of the, one of the great moments in the movie. Cause you see like, you get that wide shot, you know, of like the two figures out in the horizon as he crosses and he gets Kasim, you know what I mean? And brings it back because one yeah. of his servants is like waiting for him to come back. Um, it, it's such a great, great moment. And, really and inspirational. Absolutely. And then storyline wise, it's a great setup for later, which oh. I mean, I don't want to skip ahead, <laughs> breaks, but yeah, we could go there now. Like, it, you know, because later we, you know, after Lawrence kind of convinces, uh, Oh man, I forget how to pronounce it, but the 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 um Anthony Quinn character, uh Adu uh Ada Abu Tai, is that how you say it? <laughs> I just call him Abu because I think that's what they called him in the movie anyway. All right. Auda, Auda. Auda, Auda, Auda. All right. Go. So Auda, we'll call him Anthony Quinn. When Anthony Quinn, uh who I believe is the leader of the the Halitats, um he kind of is at the end of the desert and you know, he's he gets convinced to join with the fight as well, but he's also kind of warring with, with the Faisal's tribe. And whatever they, there's some sort of skirmish, and then there's a blood feud that basically whoever, you know, committed the offense has to be killed. And we find out who, basically, Lawrence says, okay, if I kill the offender, then 
will that satisfy your bloodlust? And, you know, oh, uh, uh, Ada says yes. And then you, he goes to Sharif, is like, is it okay if I kill uh, kill this person? And he's like, yes, it's fine. We're not going to take revenge. So when he finds out who it is, it's Gassim. And then he hesitates for a second. He says, did you do it? And Gassim says yes. And then he kills him. Uh, so it's it's it was all for not you know he he saved his life and then it didn't matter yep it's uh and then uh, i think alda has that that really great line uh where uh he's talking to to sheriff ali and he goes you know what ails the englishman you know that he killed that that he killed was the man he brought out of the, the food ah it was written then better to have left him <laughs> because <laughs> i love that piece of irony because that's exactly like don't go back like he's a goner like what's the point of risking your own life you know but of course lawrence you know wanted to you know, wanted to go get him back you know he felt it was his duty to do that to save him to bring him with the rest of the group and then in the end it was better to have left him like out have said what what a great piece of irony I, I love it i love this part now it's it's interesting that you mentioned that now given what we know about the character do you think Lawrence did it out of a sense of duty, or did you think he did it because of his ego? A little bit of both, because remember, at this point, you know, Lawrence is kind of getting a bit of an ego. He's getting a bit of a big head himself. So maybe it was, uh, it could have been partly a sense of duty, but it also could have been, hey, I crossed the desert once. I can go back and do it again. I can get this guy and come back looking all the hero. You know, because at this point, maybe Ali wasn't really respecting them that much. It wasn't until that he brought Kasim back that, like, Ali was strictly, like, on his side, if you notice. Yeah. And after bringing Kasim back, of course, he he's gifted the uh, the uh, kind of traditional Arab robes, right? Like the the white, the, the if you've ever seen the poster for this film, you've seen him, you've seen, uh, uh, you know, Peter O'Toole in the, those long, white, flowing Arab robe. I don't know what you call them, but... Um, and he, there's a great, you know, kind of sequence that he kind of goes off to the, to be by himself. This is before uh, Auda pops into the picture, right, right before. Um, and he, he he's like kind of dancing a little bit and like kind of checking himself out. And the, it's like such a little great, like he just crossed the desert. He went back, crossed it again to save someone. Now, like these people have like accepted him into the tribe and he's got he's got these um and you know with, with the with the clothing and everything and now he's he's getting a little full of himself i think right here this is whenever he's fine like it's the ego starting to kind of build up here and it's kind of emphasized there's a bit of a five minute scene after he first gets the, the robes where he kind of goes off by himself and he kind of like shows off a little bit to himself he starts kind of yeah. dancing around Sometimes. he has the dagger and he's showing off the dagger and he's kind of just like hmm I kind of like this newfound stardom that I have, you know, and, you know, I'm going to relish in it. And then that's when, um, that's when Aura shows up the first time, I think, right? To interrupt that. <laughs> yeah, that's when he interrupts him. And then they, uh, he eventually does kind of convince him to, to be part of the, uh, of the attack on Akaba, basically to, for money. Like, that's what, that's what he's going for. He's, he's yeah, going mercenary, for basically. Yeah. Um, so then they, uh, uh, what happens basically next is they basically go to Aqaba after this, right? Right. Uh, yeah, they basically take over Aqaba. I mean, there's stuff that happens, but <laughs> they, they take over Aqaba. And basically the way Lawrence kind of convinced Auda to, to go is that there would be like gold and, and, you know, money and all this stuff. But then when they get there, there's nothing. It's just like paper money. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, Lawrence basically has some, uh, because basically the plan works. Like they come in from the side and they they catch the the Turks by surprise, take over Aqaba, and they basically just pillage the place. Um, and then as they're pillaging the place, you know, Ada finds that there's no gold, and uh, Lawrence basically writes them like an IOU, like this is good for one million gold or whatever he says <laughs> <laughs> to get him. And then, um, but basically he does have to return uh, back to the. Um, he has to go back to inform. Uh, Allenby of the victory, uh, and he has to cross, I believe, the Sinai Desert. Um, yes. And as he does that, uh, he one of his two servants, I forget wh which one, uh, dies in quicksand, which 
I didn't know it was a real thing. <laughs> like I thought it was a made up thing for movies until I until I saw this movie because I always thought it was like fake. But no, and this it, they show it like he, he he hits the quicksand and he dies. Well, supposedly I think quicksand the way it's in movies from what I read is fake, but there's a real life you know, um, I guess alternator. I don't know what what other word to call it. Like, there, but there's a real life counterpart, I guess, to quicksand. I don't know what it's called. There's like a, a technical name for it, but it's basically quicksand. But the way it's in movies is not like the way it is at all in real life. So I actually I researched that a little bit. Like, is quicksand even real? And pretty much the consensus is no. Not at least the way in the movies that you see it. But there is a equivalent to it. I mean, I mean, do you remember when you were a kid, like? like- there were so many movies and TV shows that had a quicksand in it. Like, yeah, um, I forget which comic. I think it was maybe John Mulaney that says that when I was younger, I thought quicksand would be much more of a problem than it actually is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because it's it was all over, like, movies and cartoons back in the day. Um, but, uh, before you go on, going back to the scene where he saw good to, uh, to out. And by the way, he they gave him the nickname at this one. I think they called him Orins, which is kind of a wacky name. Oh, yeah. Orins, bro. Orins. So. <laughs> We're, we're we're out of this. We we're talking about like the he writes him like the fake check. Where Alda goes, you know, actually Lawrence first says, you know, did Alda come to Akaba for gold? For my pleasure, as you said, but gold is honorable, and Orin's promised gold. Orin's lied. <laughs> I start laughing with it at this scene because Anthony Quinn is just hamming it up here, I think. And of course, Lawrence goes, see Alda, the Crown of England promises to pay five thousand golden guineas to Alda Abu Tai. <laughs> Signed in His Majesty's absence by me, <laughs> being the I mean, the, bro. the gall, like to say that he has the authority to do that. <laughs> He's in full cardi mode, bro. Because I'm pretty sure he never intends to pay that money. <laughs> or he also has no authority. He has no authority to do that. <laughs> exactly. So now this is just Lars beat all cardi on him. I mean, maybe he doesn't tend to pay it, but the crown of England has no idea that he tends to pay it. Like, where is he going to get the money from? <laughs> That's um, great. <laughs> now, speaking of Alda, uh Anthony Quinn, um, <laughs> he was wearing a fake nose, right? Because there's no way his nose is that enormous. I think I'm more noted. I think wasn't he wearing brown face also? Because I don't remember Anthony Quinn being that dark. I mean, he's. I mean, what is his back? I think he's Greek, right? He is, I think he's Greek or, or something. Like, let me look this I up because so. I don't want to. I don't want to um, speak out of turn here. Uh, da, 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 da. No, he was Mexican. No, he's a Mexican actor. I thought he was Greek for some reason. Uh, so he was a Mexican actor. Um, so he was probably naturally, you know, more brown skinned. So. Maybe right. he had a little more makeup on than than uh, than uh, than uh, Omar Sharif, but I mean, this this isn't like it's not Alec in this territory. Wasn't there a wacky yeah, story picture... where like Anthony Quinn showed up in makeup to the set once and they didn't recognize him? Yeah, I, I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. Um, yeah, look, I he had, that had to be a fake nose because I'm looking at his pictures now. It, his nose was not that big, so <laughs> it was like <laughs> comically big in this movie, you know? Yeah. So he crosses the back, he crosses the sign back to like his, like the headquarters, British headquarters. And it's, you know, he immediately causes ways by bringing his little, his, his servant into like the officer's quarters and try to once to get him a lemonade. Um, and he, you know, he's taken in by, uh, you know, General Allenby wants to see him that, that general, I remember, uh, and he's there with Dryden, <laughs> uh, and, uh, basically Allenby sees Lawrence's usefulness, right? Uh, and he kind of plays it. You know, he plays to his ego a little bit because Lawrence is basically like, I'm done. Like that that was way too much. I can't go anywhere. And then, but then like almost immediately he's like, Well, we're gonna need guns and we're gonna need gold and we're gonna need this. So, like almost immediately after he says he's done, he immediately starts going, Well, all right, we can we can do this. And then we'll, I just need you to give me guns and money and blah blah blah. So, like it's it's like he Allenby plays to to his like ego a little bit here, and uh, he starts kind of forming a plan on on how to kind of leave the lead the continue leading the revolt. Right, and and the gall of Lawrence, bro. There's the scene where he's talking to to Brighton. I think before he even goes to Allenby, you know, where you know he's like, "We've taken Akaba, take it, Akaba. Who has? We have." And then you know he's you know describing you know what happened. 
where he goes, you know, cross my heart and hope to die. It's all perfectly true. It is impossible. Like, yes, it is. I did it. The gall of this guy, the ego of Lawrence, bro, to say, I did it, bro. Like, yeah, you did it, but it wasn't just you, <laughs> you know? Like, now you kind of see his ego start to get out of control at this point. But, I mean, yeah. can you kind of blame him? He almost died crossing two deserts. <laughs> Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back to that in a second. But as I said, like when we do our recordings, I always want to have like the movie playing in the background on mute just to like kind of spur like different things in me. So right now in the film, they're at the moment where they're crossing the food, and they got to that point. This is like I think the point where it just looks like complete hell to me. They're at that point where they have to pass all those like big black like rocks on the ground. Yeah. It just looks horrible, dude. It just looks like I don't want any part of this. It Ugh. just makes me want to sit in air conditioning. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, he he basically. I, this is more or less. I think this is when we get into intermission, right? Like uh, right after this. Right after this part, yeah. All right, yeah. So we get into intermission, and <laughs> you got up and took a break. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I think I just sat. There. I think I just I watched it all in one viewing. I sat there and listened to the music. But um, so we got right afterwards. We kind of get like a big action sequence where, uh, he. You know, he Lawrence has kind of united united the Arabs. He's got different tribes on his side. They're blowing up railroads owned by the Germans and the Turks. Or sorry, by the Turks. Although, actually, in my research, I think they are, it is a German railway. Um, in in real life, it was a German railway. Um, that they blew up uh, because something about how when the German army allied with the Turks, they built that railway as a way to get. Uh, oil from the Middle East. I think this would, that that's why it's there. So that's why they blow it up is to like you know stop that and it's, no pun intended in its tracks. So yeah, the, and then we we get a cool moment where he's kind of he gets shot and but he didn't he you know it's just kind of like a flesh wound. He but uh, he we get another one of those kind of moments where he's kind of full of himself. He gets on top of a train and kind of dances around a bit <laughs> after he blows up the train. And I think that, is this when we're introduced to the newspaper guy right around here. It was right before this. Remember, because when intermission comes back, he's it's the scene where he's talking to Faisal. Oh, that's right. You're right. That is that is true. Yeah, we skipped over that. Yeah, and uh, he's basically and and uh, Jackson Bentley is his name. Jackson. And Bentley. he's basically like he's he's there for the American newspapers to basically be like they want to sell. Uh, in the newspaper, they want to sell like the romance of the adventure of Lawrence, you know, in Arabia to like kind of get America kind of pumped up for for war and maybe want to enter the war themselves. Right. And so he's there to kind of uh, glamorize and sensationalize the 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 Arab revolt. Uh, so he's there to like take the pictures of the of the blowing up the train and everything. Yeah, it, Bentley basically says to Faisal, I have the quote here. He goes like, "It's very simple, sir. I'm looking for a hero." Certain influential men back home believe that the time has come for America to lend her weight to the patriotic struggle against Germany uh, and Turkey. But I've been sent to find material which will show our people that this war is, uh, and then Faisal goes, enjoyable? Oh, hardly that, sir, but to show them it's more adventurous aspects. And you're looking for a figure who will draw your country towards war. All right, yes, Lawrence is your man. That's a great little dialogue right there, because you're already seeing, like, okay— it's it's a bit of a not no so much shady but a very underhanded like motive for uh for Bentley to go you know to cover Lawrence like it's not to cover like the adventurous aspects of of this guy who you know who's leading the Arab revolt you know it's oh we want America to kind of see the war as kind of an adventure and maybe they want to go and shoot people and blow stuff up too. Uh, we also get a, a sequence where on another where on another part where they're trying to blow up the railway the railroad. Um, where Faraj, I believe is his servant's name, gets kind of stuck and uh, he's badly injured. I think he has like the triggers for like the, the bomb or something. And they don't want to, if they leave him, if they try to help him, they're not going to be able to, uh, he's going to basically, he's afraid of him getting caught and, and being tortured by the enemy. So he shoots him and, and flees. So it's more and more Lawrence is becoming just okay with killing people. Yeah, I mean, uh, Faisal set that up at the beginning because when he was telling Bentley, like, you know, we don't really have a lot of wounded. We have a lot of dead, though, because we don't leave our wounded for the Turks because they torture them. So we just kill them to kind of spare them the torture. So that kind of gets now brought up again here when um, Lawrence's servant gets uh, pretty much mortally injured and 
they don't want to leave him for the Turks to to torture. So yeah, Large basically kills him. And like you said, he seems to be getting way more comfortable with killing people. And a little bit more cocky too, because now this we finally get his his cockiness on full display. Uh, it finally comes to bite him. Uh, when he goes out to scout uh, one of the towns held by the Turks, he decides he's going to like just kind of basically just put on a uh, put on some robes and not really disguise himself. But of course, he's blonde haired, blue eyed, white skinned. He's going to get caught immediately. Come on, but he bro. thinks he's at this point. He thinks he's he's untouchable. But he does get caught almost right away, and he's taken uh, by the Turkish troops, and um, he's taken out to like the I think they call him a bay, the Turkish bay. Um, who played by Jose Ferrer, who um, interestingly enough uh, was recruited by David Lean to go in the in the movie for this five minute scene. In this five minute scene, he got paid more than uh, than <laughs> Peter O'Toole and I think uh, Omar Sharif combined. Or wait, no, or was it? Uh, uh, he got paid twenty five thousand plus a new yeah more than O'Toole and Sharif combined plus a new Porsche. To do that five minute scene, that's awesome. Um, but apparently, he did say after, like in in future interviews and stuff, that it that he considered he considered it one of his great performances. Um, so basically, he's just this guy. He he's this kind of Turkish officer, and he. This is gonna be kind of this is kind of one I want to want your take on this because, as he's being kind of invent like, I don't know, investigated is the word, um, inspected by by him. You can see that the that Jose Ferrer is kind of like fondling him a little bit and kind of touching him in very suggestive ways, right? To the point where, at one point, he they kind of cut to a close up of him looking a little bit uh, like he's ogling a little bit, you know. And that's whenever Lawrence kind of lashes out and punches him, and then he gets like flogged uh, for 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 uh, you know touching the Turkish Bay. Do you think that the film? is kind of making a little bit of a, of a commentary on, you know, uh, effeminate men or, or, or homosexuality here. Cause I mean, obviously that that's what the Bay was doing. He, that the, is very heavily implied that he was kind of, you know, groping him in a sexual way. Um, but do you think that the film is saying anything more than just what's on the surface? Personally, I don't think so. Um, I think pretty much this is all surface level. I don't think there's really any hidden meaning as far as like, you know, the, the sexualization or the feminization of, of, of Lawrence or anything like that, even though, you know, the I don't think it was ever proven if he was a homosexual or not. Like, I think that's just the rumor that, you know, even to this day, like no one really knows for sure, but they suspect that he was because uh, he was very kind of secretive in that regard. Um, But personally, I don't think there's any like hidden meaning here. I think this is all just surface level stuff like and, you know, when um. The next, right, the next scene here where he gets, uh, he gets flogged and he gets tortured. I mean, some recaps say that he was actually raped there also, which I didn't get that. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, he got raped? I mean, and then they kind of used like the scene of like, like they had, well, not the scene, but the 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 shot of like the the guard. He has like that deviant smile on his face, um, watching him. And then they even have like the Turkish Bay like in the background, kind of observing that too. So I guess from there they kind of got the impression that he was being raped, but I didn't get that at all. I don't know if you did, but I didn't see that. Uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't get that. I didn't think they went that extreme with it, to be honest. I think it was just the physical, like, beating that he got. Right. <clears throat> um, but, you know, the reason I brought it up is because Peter O'Toole kind of did lean into, like, the, uh, the like the effeminate nature that Lawrence was kind of, I don't know, accused is the right word, but he was kind of uh, uh, suspected of having, right? Um, I mean, like, the big one that, like, I think the, the one that kind of almost, like, is almost over the top is whenever, after this sequence, when he goes back to Cairo, uh, he, like, kind of meets up with some officers, you know, right when he, like, it's, I mean, the whole point of the sequence is, like, to show that he doesn't fit in with these guys anymore. He's almost gone full native, right? Because he doesn't fit with his own people anymore. He fits more right. with the Arabs. Um, but, like, he's trying to catch up with these guys, like, oh, hold on a second, fellas. And then he kind of, like, kind of skips over to them, you know, like, in a very not macho way, you know, and kind of swings his arms in a very effeminate way. And I was like, it, like, that's intentional. That's an intentional acting <laughs> choice. So, like, that's why I was wondering, you know? Right. 
So I, I just wonder if like, because if there was anything going on there, like uh, more so in the directing, because I think that O'Toole definitely made an acting choice to kind of push that side of it. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. That's why I, I could be wrong that it's all surface level. You might have a point, but personally, I just, I don't think that was the case. But yeah, so he, he does, you know, go back to Cairo after that, because after kind of failure there, goes back to Cairo. He's kind of humbled a little bit. But again, Allenby kind of, once again, kind of pushes him in the direction of going to uh, uh, take on, uh, take one final big push into Damascus, you know, uh, because he, that is where the the kind of the big final, uh, I don't want you to call it, the big big final push of the of the revolt is in Damascus. And, you know, he get, it takes some convincing, but finally, you know, Lawrence does acquiesce to it. Um, and then this is where, like he comes back and he's like almost a different guy because he comes back, you know, and he's just got a ton of mercenaries behind him. Like not like Arabs who are like there for the revolt, but just dudes that are there for the money. And it's it. And he doesn't care because he's, he just wants killers to win. Well, let me just, before we, I get to that, just before that in, in the scene, you know, what he's talking to Dryden and, and Alan being all those guys, like they're trying to convince him to kind of lead the, Lead the revolt into Damascus. Like, I love the, the scene where Dryden is basically explaining to him, like, listen, we pretty much have been lying to you as far as our stakes in Arabia. You know, they talked about the sykes Peacock agreement. And I, and then, of course, Lawrence has this great line that is as true then as it was today, where he says to Dryden, there may be honor among thieves, but there's none in politicians. So that's a great <laughs> freaking line. For, oh, very And very, very true to this day. Honor among thieves, but none in politicians. Yeah, absolutely. But, but there's a great, and there's a great whole like dialogue here, and the back and forth between Dryden, Allenby, and Lawrence. You know, they're trying to just convince him to be part of Damascus. You know, he's like, I don't want to be a part of your big push. Well, what about your Arab friends? What about them? And then as you know, th- as they're talking, the the lashes from the lash wounds from uh, from the flogging start to bleed again on 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 Lawrence. And, and, you know, there's that quick shot of his back where it's bleeding again. He goes, I have no Arab friends. I don't want Arab friends. You know, what the hell do you want, Lawrence? I told you, I just want my ration of common humanity. So he's starting to lose it, man. And he's trying to tell them, too, like, listen, I'm not fit for this anymore. My my mind, he's like, he basically told them, I'm losing my mind from all this. Like, I just want to go back home and just go back to being ordinary. I don't want to be ex- extraordinary anymore. <laughs> but then his ego won't let him really commit to that. Because then he comes back later and says, oh, well, I am extraordinary. <laughs> Even though he just finished saying that he wants to be ordinary again. So I just kind of like the, like, little by little, like, you kind of see, like, the, the uh, I guess, the end result of everything that he's gone through is now he's basically he's pretty much going from where he was at the beginning and now just completely losing his mind. And then, like you said, that when we see him, when he goes back to Arabia, he gets convinced to go back for that Damascus push. He is not the same Lawrence that we saw three hours ago. Like he is now completely uh, he's pr- pretty much fallen. I don't want to say to the dark side, but he is a completely different Lawrence now. Yeah. And, you know, we talk a lot about his ego. You know, that's one of the things that some historians kind of debate about this performance, because a lot of historians say that Lawrence was not egotistical. Like he was not someone who who like sought after the limelight and and he he did things because he thought they were the right thing to do and um, not because of the glory or whatever. And, you know, he would he'd never he would never want his picture taken. You know, if it was taken, it was like very rarely or by accident. But then there were other people that was like, no, he was an egotist, but he he made it look like he wasn't. And like right. they said, like he had a very good talent of backing into the spotlight. So it's interesting. Like, so, I mean, they play it in this film, like straight up, like he has a big ego. Right. Um, but it's debated whether that's how Lawrence really was or not, which is interesting. Right. Um, so whenever Sheriff Ali sees all these, you know, all these mercenaries, he is not, he's not thrilled with, with it because Sheriff Ali is like the, kind of like the conscience is, is like his little conch. He's like his Jiminy Cricket, right? <laughs> you know, he's, he's, every time, every time he's always there to tell Lawrence, you can't do that. That's messed up. And then like, you know, Lawrence always does it and kind of, it, it, he, he, Sheriff Ali finally, you know, always kind of goes, all right, I guess that worked. But, uh, but like. Here we get this moment where, you know, he's bringing all these mercenaries, these killers, and Sheriff Ali is really obviously not okay with it. And it's really uh, shown whenever, you know, they they come across this uh, village 
um, where the residents have been killed. And uh, Lawrence, instead of continuing on uh, to Damascus, decides that he's going to take revenge for this town. And he sees, you know, he sees the retreating Turkish soldiers who are kind of in bad shape, right? So some of them are fine, but some of them like are in bad shape. And he, this is where we get the very famous "no prisoners" line, because well, I think right. one of the, one of the other guys says, "You know, take no prisoners." And he starts he starts charging, and that guy gets shot down. And then that's when he goes, "No prisoner." I say that like all the time, like for no reason. Like I think in my head, like, no <laughs> <laughs> like you know, I, I, you know, you know how you sometimes think in movie quotes. Like I think about that line all the time in, in random situations. Um, and yeah, we get this like bloody sequence where they just wipe the floor and just it's not like it's not an act of like warfare. It's an act of like just pure like devastation just killing these people right because right before this happens like you said sheriff ali you know lawrence's conscience that you know we can go around these guys we don't have to go through them we can go around them and still make damascus and after that one guy kind of charged because it was his village that the turks massacred he wanted his revenge so i he knew going in by himself he was gonna get cut down and he did rather quickly so lawrence saw that he's like you know what screw these guys Let's get him, which is, you know, morally was probably the wrong thing to do, but he did it anyway. He didn't listen to Tsu Ali like, like, he, like he always does, and they just, it was another massacre. They massacred the Turks there to the point where even uh, the reporter, Bentley, you know, he's even sickened at what he sees. He's like, Jesus, I love that line, Jesus wept. He just sees, like, the carnage that Lawrence and, and, the, and his, uh, his troops kind of left behind there. He's like, Jesus wept. And there's that... um. He talks to Ali where he goes, does this surprise you, Mr. Bentley? Surely, you know, the Arabs are barbarous people, barbarous and cruel. That line comes back again. Who but they? Who but they? And then <laughs> Bentley goes to Lawrence. Oh, you rotten man. Here, let me take your rotten bloody picture for the rotten bloody newspapers. Another, What a great di- lines, great dialogue for, for these characters, man. This is what a great movie. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great moment. And this is like his... In his hero's journey, this is like his lowest point right here, you know, yep. where he just he just crossed that line like he went too far. You know, he crossed that line he shouldn't have crossed. Yep. And his white robes are all stained with blood. That, that yeah. per- oh, perfect, that's perfect visual right there. Yeah. yeah great, great visual. Um, so the he, he, him and his forces end up getting to Damascus and they do take over the, the city and they they uh, they manage to defeat the Turks and, and take over the Damascus. Uh, but of course, the, he united all the Arabs to get there. But once they're there, the Arabs cannot stay united um, because when they're when they have a, he sets up a council. Um, uh, I forget what he what is the council itself called the. Uh, Let me see. It's oh, the it's, Arab National Council. The Arab National Council. That's easy enough. I should, no, I should have remembered that. The Arab <laughs> National Council. All these tribes. All they do is bicker against each other with each other, you know, because one Arab, one count, one one tribe is in, far, is in charge of the hospitals, one tribe is in charge of the utilities, one you know this and that, and none of them are getting along because none of them are doing it because also the British forces are also kind of putting the putting a monkey in the works by you know not turning things on and and letting things so like it just turns into chaos and he cannot keep them united. He kept them united for one goal, but once they got there, he could not keep it. Exactly. Like you have that big scene in, in the council. You know, they're acting in the absence of Prince Faisal to get things done. And all they're doing is just bickering with each other. And it's like, you know, nothing is nothing like the utilities are off. Like they, they, they can't run the, the, the city the way it's supposed to be run. So it's almost like they're starting to give up. Like, oh, you know, the British are offering to, you know, kind of turn everything on for us and get everything up and running, you know. And Lawrence is like, no, like you take English engineers and you take the English government, which he's right. Like if you let them start running things, then they're the ones really in charge. Like, it's not you anymore. He's got a point. So. But that's not enough, like, to stop the bickering between everybody. And then, like, even Auda, you know, it's like, like, what is it? Like, is it this? Like, I tell you, this is nothing. Is it the blood? The desert has dried up more blood than you could think of. Well, this is when Lawrence is like, you know, I'm kind of getting sick of this. And it's like, there, he had the goal, like we said at the beginning. He had that main motivation to unite the Arab people. 
which he did. He got them to Damascus, like you said he was. The egotistical Lord. He, he made the predictions. I'm going to get him to Damascus. I'm going to give it to him. And he did. But it's just, he's sitting in that council. And you can tell, like, that's a great kind of body language performance by Peter O'Toole. Like, he's just sitting there, and he's just so exasperated. You couldn't even tell, like, he's just tired of all this BS. And he's not even saying anything. He just, the shot of him just sitting there kind of all despondent and listening to all the back and forth from these tribes. He like, he's like, it's one of those things like we're like, if you want to relate it to, to like people like me and you, like you were at work and you're just listening to all this bickering from like your higher ups and your coworkers. You're like, you know what? I'm clocking out for the day. I'm done. You know? <laughs> and it's like, uh, Peter O'Toole has that like perfect facial expression, that perfect body language just sitting there. And it's like, I'm just, you know, I, I united you guys and you're not, you're not cooperating and I'm just, I'm done. You know, I give up. And it's uh, just, just a great performance there by Peter O'Toole as well. Yeah, great. And of course, you know, as, as the different tribes leave one by one, of course, who are the last two there at the end? Uh, Sheriff Ali and, and Auda, the two guys that were with him from the beginning are now there at the end with him before they finally both kind of take off themselves. Um, yeah, great, you know, great sequence there. Um, really loved it. And I love um, that cherry on top, too, between uh, Auda and uh, and uh, Sheriff Ali were like, they right at the end there, even them, they kind of go back to their old, like, primal instincts you know you're a howitat you know I, i'll kill you right now it's like all that progress that they made throughout the movie and then just to go back to kind of where they were at the beginning as, as two like rival tribes that's kind of one of the, the big tragedy of that you know yeah it, it and then they all goes back and then to to the Give you give you more of a kick to the groin you, you know lawrence is uh taken back and he's you know meeting with alan b and uh he uh, he's there and he sees that Faisal and Allenby are kind of reaching a deal, <laughs> and uh, he realized you know they promote him to colonel and send him back to Britain and they realize he realizes like they g- both got what they wanted from me and now I'm I'm of no more use to them to either one. Exactly, you know, and um, yeah, they they have that uh, discussion with um. You know, they have uh, between Faisal, Allenby, I think Dryden's there also. And it's like, you know, they talk about Lawrence after. I mean, they pretty much talk about him behind his back. You know, it's like, you know, um, ah, yes. Like, well, Faisal was like, oh, but Orange is a sword with two edges. We are equally glad to be rid of him, are we? <laughs> and like, what an, what an a-hole, bro. Like, this guy got you Damascus, and you're talking about him behind his back. Like, we're glad to be rid of him. Like, I got what I wanted from him. I'm glad he's gone now, you know? What an yeah. a-hole. Um, now, that part was always a little, like, fuzzy to me. Is it because... Because, I mean, he was... He was... Um, uh, doing everything that he wanted for him. That Faisal would have wanted. So why would he think that, like, he wants to be rid of him? Is because, like, he's too much... Like, he's just a guy who's just too much in the center of the spotlight. And kind of it kind of... What's the word I'm looking for? Like detracts from his own leadership, you know? Is that what he, or is it that maybe Faisal didn't want all the Arabs united? You know, he just wanted his his tribe to be on top. You know, um, I'm not quite sure what what it was. I mean, maybe they say it in the movie, but it's one of those things that, like, the, when you get into the politics of it all, that I maybe I got got a little lost in as to why Faisal's glad to be rid of him. Yeah, I remember when I when I watched it the first time, I was even confused. I'm like, wait a minute, like. I thought you guys were friends, and you're talking about him like, oh, well, he's. I'm glad he's gone. You know, I think it was more of like, well, like like you kind of said your original point, that maybe Lars is getting a little too big for his britches, you know, with the spotlight and everything, and to have him out of the way now, maybe he can focus on, on ruling and maybe trying to, you know, at least maybe getting his tribe under control, you know? Like, Lawrence was too much of a distraction. Yeah, I, maybe that's it. Yeah, I, I just, it was one of those things that, that that's the one thing, and maybe... Our, our listeners can can tell us and inform us what it was, but it's one of those things that just was never quite clear on. I could see why the British wanted him out of the way. He he had a use, he fulfilled his usefulness, and now he was such a pain in the ass. Like they just want to be rid of him now because he does. We they got what they wanted, but um, yeah, it's just one of those things that maybe I just couldn't quite wrap my head around. But yeah, um, yeah, and the basically the film ends at that point. Shortly after that, as he's kind of heading back, you know, he's in a jeep and he's heading back to. Back to England, but um, and then obviously we know how his life ends. But yeah, that's the end of the film. We get some exit music again, um, and yeah, one of the 
pro- like again, I mean, we've covered a couple epics on the show. We've covered Gone with the Wind. We've covered Ben Hur. You know, like big sprawling movies. I think this is like the biggest of the big sprawling movies. You know, this is, I mean, an epic adventure movie. Yeah, this is like I said in the beginning. This is a very much an events film. And it's now it's on my bucket list to see this on the big screen. Like I missed out when TCM was doing their uh their big screen classics. I hope they do it again down the road. And if they pick it again to screen maybe for a weekend or so, I'm I'm definitely there, no matter where it is. So uh, yeah, it it, it it looks beautiful on the big screen. Yeah, it's one of those movies that's kind of it's made obviously for the big screen, and that's how it's meant to be seen. So I want to be able to experience that in that at some point, you know, down the road. But you know, for now, I have the I have my nice TV set. I have the nice Blu-ray, and it's it looks as good as as it ever has on Blu-ray as well. So, you know, I was glad to kind of make it a cinematic experience for myself as much as I could with this last uh, viewing that I had. And, um, you know, here's to uh, many more viewings of this classic film. Yeah, it really does get better uh, every time you see it. Like at least that's my experience. It just um, every time I see it, just gets better. Um, one kind of theme. I wanted to talk about with you. Uh, do you consider the character? So the um, T.E. Lawrence himself was ranked in the AFI's list of uh, 100 greatest movie heroes. Um, I forget which number he was in. I can look that up in a minute. Um, do you consider T.E. Lawrence a hero? Like as he's portrayed in the film? That's an interesting question because I don't know. I kind of see him more of an anti-hero in a way because I mean he starts out with the right intentions, with the right motivation, you know. But in the end, he kind of lets his ego get the best of him, and like you know his excessive arrogance. You know he becomes a masochist by the end too, you know, and he just you know his constantly pushing of the limits, you know, kind of lead to his own downfall in a way. And to his belief that he kind of failed in his mission. So it's it's interesting that he's considered, I guess, the hero, which he kind of is in a way. But it's like I see him more as an antihero because the journey that he takes while well motivated in a way, well motivated with good intentions, he just takes like that 180 turn and he turns into this like egotistical masochist. And it's like, well, that's not really a hero. So. I don't know. That, that, that's an interesting uh, category that they put him in. I would say he's more of an anti-hero. Yeah, I, I think he is a hero up until up until the No Prisoners, really. Like, Because he at that point, even if he's motivated by selfish uh, by selfish um, by a selfish drive, he's still inspiring like people and he's still inspiring people to, to do something great, you know, um, and defeat a common enemy. Uh, I get you. So you, I feel like you could call him a hero in that sense, but then once he kind of changes that, takes that turn, that's where maybe he is more of an anti-hero. I, I, I just, I just found it interesting that they ranked him. He, by the way, I looked up, he's ranked at number 10, uh, behind George Bailey for it's wonderful life. So, um, wow. Yeah. That, that's where, that's where he is. So interesting placement um i don't know uh it, it, it's an interesting thought to make, call him a hero yeah um so any uh kind of other major kind of themes or or scenes that you want to talk about before we get on to kind of its legacy uh, i think we pretty much covered all the good high spots on this so i i'm good all right so the film was a massive success when it was released um, it uh, not only won a bunch of awards, it was a big financial success. Uh, currently, uh, as in the top 100 movies, um, uh, ranked for their you know adjusted box office lifetime gross, it is number. Let's see here, 84, clocking in at adjusted uh, 507 million dollars. Uh, in its initial run, it made 45 million, which in today's money is 507 million. Um, now ob- that does not include worldwide grosses cause they didn't have that information at the time. So it's probably likely a lot more than that. Uh, but yeah, $507 million mo- in today's money. So it's, it was a huge hit. Um, and the Oscars, it cleaned up. Um, let me see how many it was nominated for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12, uh, Academy Awards. And it won nine, including best picture. Uh, director for Lean, best, uh, let's see what else, 
art direction, cinematography, film editing, music score, and sound mixing. Uh, Peter O'Toole uh, did not win for Best Actor and is famously uh, never won an Oscar. Uh, he would be nominated many times throughout his career and never won an Oscar. He eventually did get an honorary award at one point, but he never won a right. competitive award. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, I mean, he did lose to the better <laughs> man, though. You, you know who won in his place, right? For this, I am looking that up. Give me one second. Uh, oh, yeah, to Gregory Peck for To Kill a Mockingbird. That makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. <laughs> um, but, however, but yeah, but... Ed Begley won for Sweet Bird of Youth over Omar Sharif. So that's kind of annoying. Yeah, I've seen Sweet Bird of Youth. I would have given that to Sharif. Yeah, that's. Um... That that is a that is annoying. I will give you that. Yeah, uh, Omar Sharif, like you said, best supporting actor and best screenplay. Uh, it was nominated but didn't win, and it lost to. Let's see here. Uh, I lost it. Let's see. Probably the superior one, I think. I mean, I, I do love Lawrence of Arabia, but I kind of love this one more. <laughs> Oh, To Kill a Mockingbird again. Yeah, so it lost to To Kill a Mockingbird again. So, um, yeah, it, it. but you can't say it was not a successful award winner. Uh, it's yep. top many of the AFI lists. Uh, it's on their 100 greatest films. It's uh, on their greatest movie heroes, like I mentioned. I believe it's on their most inspirational movies, which I totally get, because it's very inspirational, especially that that moment where he gets Kasim out of the desert. Um, right. Yeah, one of, the, uh, one of the greatest, like, it's absolutely... On every level, um, one of the great adventure films of all time and one of the great, you know, epics of all time. I think probably, perhaps the greatest epic of all time. Oh, absolutely. Um, like I said, I, I, that this film, no matter what, will always have a special place in my heart with the way I was able to see it for the first time and kind of the my family history behind watching this movie. And... Again, it's one of those things that it's 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 an annual watch for me because it really is like I said it's an, it's an event film and it's it's one of the great epics probably one of the greatest epics if not the greatest epic of all time and there's a lot of uh, epics in contention for that title and to, to be able to say that about Lawrence of Arabia uh, says a lot about its quality when it comes to the acting the cinematography the score just everything about it the direction. The script, everything about this movie just screams grand. It screams important. And Lawrence of Arabia just checks all those boxes. And it really is just an amazing film. Uh, th this, sorry, this just came. I was just looking at some different sites here. Just a random piece of trivia here. Um, and it, you probably didn't think about it when you watched it. But when you when I say this piece of trivia, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, this is a movie with absolute with 100 percent. I shouldn't say 1 percent. This is a movie with absolutely zero female characters. I did read that somewhere. I forgot where Not it was. One. But that came across <laughs> uh, when I was doing my research. I was like, yeah, there's no female speaking parts at all here. I don't even think you see a woman on camera. Do you? I don't think you do. I think you see the in the, the village. Uh, I think you see dead women. Okay, well, oh, that's great. So yeah, this, I mean, that doesn't make it better. I'm just saying, but there is a, <laughs> women on screen, even if they're dead. <laughs> so uh, this movie does not pass the Bechdel test. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, not, I'm not saying that against it. I'm just, I just think that's an interesting bit, bit of trivia. Um, you can watch this film. Let me see. On most uh, streaming platforms, you can buy it digitally. I don't believe it's playing anywhere for you know with a subscription. I'll double check that real quick. All right, uh, I am not finding anywhere right now where there is where it is streaming anywhere for with a subscription. Um, but uh, you can buy it on physical media and on digital media as well. Uh, obviously, we are proponents of physical media here. I have the. Most recent 4K release that includes the uh, 4K and the Blu-ray has a ton of special features that I didn't actually have a chance to get through. But um, the most recent Columbia Pictures uh, uh, 4K release has a ton. Like it's a uh, Peter O'Toole revisits uh, Lawrence of Arabia, making Lawrence of Arabia documentary, deleted scenes, conversation with Steven Spielberg. Uh, I mean, just like at least 20 different uh 20 different uh, special features here so always to me worth it to get the to get the uh, physical media right i don't see uh, the only place i see that you can stream it is on amazon prime but you have it's you have to pay 2.99 to rent it so 
Yeah, and, and you can, and yeah, and you can obviously buy and rent it on your n- normal places like iTunes, Amazon, you know, uh, Vudu, things like that. Right. Um, but yeah, but buy the buy the disc though, because it looks beautiful on a nice TV. Absolutely. All right. Uh, now it's time to find out what our next film will be. So it's time to right. bust out the random movie generator. And let's see what it's going to pick for us this time. Kate's thinking. And it has picked another Oscar winner, another Best Picture Oscar winner from the 1960s. It has picked 1969's Midnight Cowboy. Sweet, 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 sweet. Because I have my Criterion version that I have not opened yet. So now it's a good chance to take it out of the plastic. So (laughs) I also have my Criterion that I have not opened yet. Well, I have opened it, but I have not taken the disc out to watch it yet. So looking forward to to watching to rewatching that uh, Criterion. So that that is our next uh, movie is uh, Midnight Cowboy. Make sure to tune in for that. Um, Hey, I'm walking here. I'm walking here. (laughs) All right. uh, Let's do some plugs now. Um, EssentialFilmsPodcast.com is the website. Uh, follow me at Essential Films Podcast on Twitter. Uh, actually, I'm an idiot. At Essential Films on Twitter, no podcast. Uh, at Essential Films on Twitter, uh, you can go to uh, facebook.com slash the essential films to follow us there. Um, I also am trying to do a bit of uh, content for the, uh, my YouTube page, uh, which you can go to at uh, youtube.com slash Adolfo J. Acosta. And um, yeah, please like and subscribe and make sure that you get the word out on this podcast so that, you know, it reaches more listeners. Mark, what do we have going on on your side of things? So you can follow me on Twitter at SportsGuy515. You can also follow Forrest Perspective, our other show, on Twitter at FP Movie Podcast. Uh, the last two shows we did for Forrest Perspective were basically the Oscars talking about uh, the awards, the winners, the ceremony, which is pretty much a flop. Um, and kind of going into you know our yearly Oscar mania uh, discussion. Um, we hope to come back in the next week or so, maybe next couple weeks with some more recent films. Like I know there's some um, a lot from HBO Max that we can get into. Um, I'm about to watch The Conjuring this weekend. I haven't gotten to it yet because I'm actually just going back and rewatching all of the other films to kind of uh, get amped for it, like I did with Godzilla vs Kong. So we'll be talking about that. I don't know if you're gonna watch The Conjuring, but it's a good one to kind of. Get back on the horse with as far as sports perspective. So um, we're going to have a, a few more uh, recent films also on the docket. So uh, be sure to look out for that down the line. Um, speaking of the Oscars, uh, I did finally, and I know you've been waiting for this, finally caught up with the Five Bloods. And all I have Ooh. to say is how, in any possible just world, did Delroy Lindo not get a nomination? Delroy Lindo, man. How is that possible? Like, <clears throat> I mean, say whatever you want about the rest of the film. It's a good film. Um, but how did Delroy Lindo not get an Oscar nomination for that movie? Unbelievable. I, I don't know. And yeah, I mentioned that on the show. It's just, I, I, I can't believe it. It's, it, it was just a weird year in general with nominations. So maybe that we just cough it up to COVID, but it's just, it's it looked terrible. Great. I watched another round. Um, it's a great movie. Um, with Mads Mikkelsen, yes, I would have I would have kicked out Mads Mikkelsen and put in Del Rey Lindo, because um, but that's just me. Um, but it is a good movie. You definitely should go check it out. It's not a, it's, I'm not sliding it in the in the bit, but Del Rey Lindo's performance was so good, um, and I would have probably pushed that above Mads Mikkelsen's performance. That's just me. Yeah, well, with another run, I'll probably just wait for the Leo version at this rate. <laughs> oh, right. With that. <laughs> the Leo version. <laughs> Dumb. This, the suits, man. Gotta love them. I mean, it's not that... It's, sorry. it's not like it's an un... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like it's a hard film to get, right? Like, it's yeah. a pretty straightforward movie. Like, there's no... It's not really... It's not very difficult to understand. I don't understand why you have to remake it in English. It's like I, I understand if you remade it in English twenty years from now, but like a year later, come on. Exactly. Like it's just whatever. It's a suit mentality. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, the Five Bloods. Uh, random recommend at the end of the episode. I would recommend the Five Bloods and another round. Uh, but Delroy Lindo, like one of the.
Welcome back to the Essential Films Podcast, a podcast devoted to the discussion of the greatest movies ever made or the essential films. I'm Rafa Costa, your host, and I am joined by Mr. Uh, bleh, 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 bleh. Let me start that again. 